Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, ACA for Java Developers, Bridging the Imagination Gap, um, led by Devin DeVore, our resident ACA expert and trainer here at TypeSafe. Uh, thanks everyone for your patience this morning while we get everything set up. Um, Duncan's going to be walking us through concepts like uh, why do I need to think distributed, what exactly is ACA and what is it used for, and um, how can I leverage ACA as a Java developer. My name is Laura Masterson, and I'll be your host for Duncan's presentation. And before I hand things over, just a few reminders. First of all, this presentation is being recorded, so we'll make those, the recording available within the next day or so, along with the slides and any other material that Duncan covers in his session. Uh, if you need to drop off or experience any audio difficulties, I know we're getting a little bit of a late start, so um, we'll be sharing those, the recording as quickly as we can and you can rewatch it soon. Uh, if you have any questions for Duncan or myself throughout the presentation, just insert those into the little chat box in the lower left-hand side of your screen, and I'll do my best to address those as we go through, um, and then saving a few for Duncan at the end so that we can do a Q&A. Um, all right, well with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Duncan. Dun Duncan, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, take it away. Hi, everyone. Nice to uh, be here with you all. Good morning or afternoon, depending on your location. Uh, my name's Duncan, and I work at TypeSafe. And um, I work in uh, the area of uh, ACA and training. And today we're going to talk about uh, the notion behind ACA and um, how it can uh, be used with Java. But a lot of times folks think you can use it just with Scala, but that's actually not the case at all. It's a, a very powerful toolkit that you can use to solve a lot of problems, I, I think, that are go going to begin to increase as we start to embrace uh, the changes that we're facing as developers and architects uh, for our, our companies and, and our customers. So I'm going to start out here with what our outline is, the things that we're going to discuss. The first thing uh, that we're going to talk about, which is uh, a very important topic, is the notion of uh, distributed systems in general and why this is something that as developers and architects and also as uh, managers, business managers and such, that we need to consider um, because it's, it's a different paradigm when we're de designing and we're building applications uh, as compared to the more traditional approach uh, that we're used to generally. So as we take a look at the landscape that we see out there um, as developers, um, we, we, we come across this idea of uh, a, a new type of demand that is being placed on us. Um, and that demand is uh, related to uh, several different things, uh, primarily driving that demand is the idea that uh, our customers, uh, whether they be internal to our company or they be external, are expecting uh, a response uh, from our applications that may not be something that we're used to. So as a result, uh, the techniques and the patterns that we've implemented in the past, the things that we have uh, laid out, uh, don't always work, and we're noticing more and more that they're becoming more and more problematic. So the first thing that we have to ask ourselves and step back is, you know, what's the scenario here? What's going on? Why, why the change? Well, obviously, as the Internet has grown significantly, um, we see a lot of different challenges that are being uh, approaching us. If you've heard of things like the Internet of Things or, or what have you, um, a whole lot of new devices are coming online. We have mobile phones. We have, um, you know, uh, Internet-ready devices uh, that are extending into our households. Uh, we have the notion of smart houses and smart buildings that are connecting to the Internet. So a whole new variety of what you could call customers, even if they're not humans, are connecting to the Internet, are connecting to our systems. And... Um, are asking, hey, we would like to have access uh, to what your, your application provides. And in addition to that, we see this notion 
of um, the way systems and the way the the, uh, the the back ends that we use have changed. So in uh, years past, yesterday, as we see in this slide, we had the notion of deploying our uh, solutions to really a single machine. And in today's world, that has changed significantly. Uh, the expectations are uh, clusters of machines. Um, uh, back in the 90s when we would build an application, um, we would uh, perhaps uh, find someone who would co-locate our application for us and we would install it there. And then uh, many companies have their own data centers and such. Um, and then as time went on, um, the notion of clustering these machines became important because the amount of load that was uh, coming in became too great for a single machine to handle. Um, Multi-core processors, uh, anybody, you know, almost all of us have smartphones, right? Many of those smartphones in and of themselves have multiple cores in them. Our laptops uh, have multiple cores, four cores, eight cores. If you have a, a powerful desktop, you can have, you know, 16 cores or what have you. So the notion that um, you have multiple cores on your machine uh, implies that you can leverage those cores. You can now begin to do true parallel computing. Um, and things like RAM, which used to be very expensive, are, are now relatively inexpensive. Uh, I remember back in the uh, late 80s, you know, in the early 90s, uh, RAM was incredibly expensive. Now you can get it for, you know, gigs of RAM for $50, $60. Disk space, the same way. Disk space was very expensive. Um, uh, if you go back again, you know, you should think of the older machines like uh, PRS 80s or something like that for PCs or an AS400 um, for minis. Uh, they were expensive. The, 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 um, uh, the cost of, of uh, disk drives were very expensive. Now it's relatively cheap. Um, if you think of Gmail, Gmail always presents the notion of you know, don't ever delete an email. Just keep it there forever. And the reason is, is because um, uh, the, 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 the price of, of disk space is much cheaper. Uh, network, network latency was a, a huge issue. And um, now we have uh, fiber op optics installed. Uh, remember in the 90s, um, uh, I had a business where I had two T1s coming in, and I think I paid $3,000 a month. Um, I now have at my house, uh, I think, 75 um, megs up and down, and it's uh, $150 a month or something like that. So the price of uh, uh, network connections has drastically decreased. The number of users has increased um, uh, at, at, at almost an unimaginable level. Um, in the 90s, again, working on systems, hundreds of users um, even thousands of users was considered uh, a very large application. Some of the uh, clients that we deal with are talking on the terms of millions of uh, uh, simultaneous users. So that, that is a whole different concept, something that uh, wasn't even really dreamed of uh, uh, in the early days. Data sets is another huge issue, right? The amount of data that we're capturing is, is uh, massive. Uh, one of the places I worked, we were receiving um, data at the rate of 30,000 um, uh, essentially data points a minute, which actually today is relatively small compared to some of the, thing that's, some of the things that are going on out there. Data sets in the petabytes and even larger are not uncommon now. And latency, um, Anyone who is building a, a system, uh, even back in the 2000s, you know, like uh, 2003, 2004, some of the requirements were, you know, as long as the screen presented itself within a second or two or three seconds, that was acceptable. And in today's world, uh, people expect um, almost instantaneous response. And um, they don't really care about why your system is having problems or what is going on. They want uh, a response back to the screen, uh, you know, in, in sub-second time. If you're build, building any type of real-time or near real-time systems, 
the requirements are always uh, sub-second response. And so when you're presented with these types of uh, challenges, uh, many of the patterns and many of the ways that we design applications or that we've learned uh, just don't, um, you know, uh, they're just not capable of, of doing these types of things. Um, a good um, way to look at this is uh, following the previous slide is, is coming to cost, right? Back uh, in the 70s when you looked at the price of storage, it was massive, right? Now today, 2010, you can buy terabytes of, of data uh, for a much uh, less price. Same thing with um, CPU, right? Uh, per um, cycle back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even in the early 2000s, it was very expensive. Now uh, the price has dropped 59 cents there in 2009. Bandwidth, as I had mentioned earlier, um, the price, even as late as uh, 1998, was still very, very expensive. Today, it's, it's extremely cheap. The average household um, has uh, more bandwidth coming into it than um, large businesses did, even as early as you know, six, seven, eight years ago. And uh, the network number of hosts on a network has increased uh, geometrically, right? So um, compared to where we were even as early as five years ago to where we are today, uh, the increase has been um, monumental. So these are, these are changes in our landscape that if we don't uh, begin to really um, embrace and come up with a plan on how we're going to deal with them, uh, it, it can have a significant impact, not just us as architects and developers, but also us as companies. And um, there's a really good um, study that was done by MIT in conjunction with Capgemini Consulting. And at the end of the study, uh, they basically came to the conclusion that companies in general, uh, when they uh, start to embrace this new landscape, if they don't adopt new technologies, if they don't um, uh, adapt or change the way that they operate, then they have the, the very uh, re reality is they can face uh, competitive obsolescence. Um, and one of the, uh, I think, the most significant cases of that is, uh, you know, the, the famous Netflix versus Blockbuster, right? Um, at one point, uh, Netflix, uh, I'm sorry, Blockbuster had an opportunity to buy Netflix for $50 million. And when we look at the landscape today, um, Blockbuster had to file bankruptcy. They're no longer around. And the reason was because they didn't embrace uh, the changing landscape, right? They didn't embrace the reality of the business world and what was happening. And as a result, unfortunately, um, they ended up going bankrupt. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of folks lost their jobs and such. So it's a very real um, um, issue that, that has to be dealt with, but not just at the, at the development and architecture level. It's, it's at the company level as well. Um, another one, Amazon. When Amazon started out, um, I remember when I first looked them up, I'm like, what is this? And, and you know, they were a bookstore, and, and they had this idea of e-commerce. You'll remember back in... 2000 and all that, um, how e-commerce was this, that, and the other thing. In, in 2007, 2008 time period, um, Amazon's web services component of uh, their company outpaced their actual global retail sales. And that is, that's really significant if you sit back and you think about it because their initial uh, design was not to sell web services, right? Their initial design was to do e-commerce and online store, but in order to do that, as the demand grew, they had to significantly invest in their back-end systems to be able to keep pace with the demand. They had to uh, take a different approach. Um, they had to uh, embrace the notion of things like distributed computing and stuff like that. And so they ver were very much trailblazers in that area, along with Google and others as well. And as a result, <clears throat> um, uh, an aspect of their business they did not 
consider ended up becoming a mainstay. So the idea here is, is that the notion of distributed computing is something that we now must embrace because it has an impact um, not just in the cool factor, but it has an impact on uh, how we do business and are we going to be able to stay competitive uh, because if we don't, um, our customer or our competitors, uh, the Internet is kind of, what, uh, is kind of like an equalizer, right? Uh, a smaller company embraces modern technology. They can spin something up that's competitive and they can react to their customers faster and many times offer it uh, at a lower cost because um, they don't have as much overhead. So one of the missions of TypeSafe is to provide those tools and provide the, um, uh, the philosophy and uh, kind of uh, uh, the patterns to help you do that. And um, if you followed us, I'm sure you're familiar with the notion of a reactive system. And what does that mean? I'm not going to go into that in great detail in this presentation, but um, it is, is one thing I, I, it is important to cover. At the, at the pinnacle of, of the, this, these four pillars is the notion of responsiveness. And responsiveness is the most important thing um, to a customer, right? They want whatever they're consuming of yours to be responsive. They're not interested in what your problems are. They just want the results. Un responsiveness, however, is going to rely on the notion of being able to be elastic and being re resilient. Elasticity is the idea of being able to scale horizontally by adding machines or scaling vertically by using more resources on a particular machine, i.e. the cores uh, in your processor. And resilience, obviously, is, is like fault tolerance, only um, it and bakes into it the notion of self-healing. So your application isn't just fault tolerant. It isn't um, uh, like you, with load balancing. That's part of it, but it also is able to detect failure. It embraces failure, and as a result, it takes the appropriate action to heal itself, if you will, kind of like the human body. And underneath all of this, providing the ability is the, is the notion of a message-driven architecture, and that's what uh, ACA is all about. So or one of the things that goes all about. So the idea is, is modern applications need to embrace, embrace these changes, not just by kind of wrapping them around their older style of development. They need to actually kind of incorporate it into the DNA, into their thinking. And that thinking needs to weave its way into not just the, um, I, uh, you know, the technology division of the company, but the company isn't uh, as a whole. Um, so the challenges behind this, uh, once you begin to think about uh, a distributed environment, um, you're going to begin to leverage things like concurrency and distribution in general. And when we step into the world of concurrency, um, we, anybody who spent time writing multi-threaded programs, you realize um, uh, there's quite a bit of challenge uh, behind doing that. And just a quick definition of concurrency, it's, it's, it's the idea that properties of a system in which several computations are executing simultaneously and potentially interacting with each other. Um, so when the notion of concurrency began to be introduced back in the 60s and the 70s, you know, we started out with the process essentially where you could uh, swap back and forth, uh, suspend things, um, you know, the, the operating system could allocate new resources and such, um, providing different methods and using semaphores and all these types of things, basically uh, sitting on top of a scheduler who would make decisions about who could have access to a particular resource and who would be temporarily paused. And so you had this idea of multitasking. And then we... Uh, what came along was threading, right? The threading model, a fantastic model um, that allowed uh, the idea of a multi-program control flow to exist in, within the same process and so forth. And this began to lay the path to the notion of parallelism and simultaneous scheduling and all these other great things. However, the result of that uh, led to some significant challenges, and the primary challenge being non-determinism. 
prior to uh, this, we thought sequentially, right? We uh, would do one thing, and when that one thing completed, we would then move on to the next. And so we, from a deterministic point of view, knew how things would operate. When we threw into the mix concurrency, we now had this area where, okay, we have things that are happening, uh, you know, in effect at the same time, and we don't necessarily have a guarantee that they're going to resolve in the order that we would like them to resolve. So one of the key um, uh, quotes that I really, really like is by Edward Lee, and he said, although threads seem to be a small step from sequential computation, in fact, they represent a huge step, and they discard one of the most essential and appealing properties of sequential computation or sequential thought is understandability and predictability, in other words, determinism. And so what ends up happening is in this computational thought process, everything becomes wildly non-deterministic, and the programmer ends up uh, becoming essentially a pruner of this non-deterministic uh, non behavior. And um, that can be quite painful, actually. So the reason that we run into this is because we, we are coming from this uh, sequential thought process and things like shared mutable state in a sequential environment are not an issue. However, in a concurrent environment, they become a significant problem. And <clears throat> to try to take care of that through your um, standard methods of locking and um, blocking and callbacks and all that kind of stuff um, becomes very difficult. Uh, because it, it, there's no real easy way to test it. There's no real easy way to, um, you know, keep track of it. And, and it becomes very, very, very difficult. And it takes a very experienced programmers and such. And th th that increases the cost of developing an application. So when I um, uh, think of concurrency, I, I like to look at it like this. This is my definition of it. It's, it's, it's madness. It's mayhem. Um, it's, it's like a traffic jam. All this stuff is happening at once, and it's very difficult to uh, reason about. Uh, you have uh, the Heisenberg bug is a famous uh, uh, quote, where essentially your, your application runs fine, and then all of a sudden there's some error that happens because of perhaps thread starvation or a race condition or something like this. So then you have the challenges of distribution in general. So what is distribution? Distribution is a system where components are located on different computers, and essentially they're going to coordinate their actions. They're loosely coupled, and they're going to do it through the notion of Wikipedia, or Wikipedia, through the notion of passing messages back and forth. Wikipedia was the reference here. Um, and this model is, is becoming the normal model. It's becoming the model that we're seeing. Um, through things like cloud services. Um, and it also has a financial impact as well because you can take a um, cloud-based service that you can purchase, and you can purchase it um, basically on a usage scale. So you want to be able to say, hey, when my load increases, I'm going to use this service more. So obviously they're going to charge me more money. However, when my load decreases, they're going to uh, charge me less money. So this can tie back into the economics of the business. Um, you know, big data <clears throat> and the way that it works, the notion of clustering, and not just clustering within a data center, but clustering across a data center. So these types of concepts are starting to become uh, common day. And as companies and as developers, um, we want to be able to leverage these uh, new tools uh, so that, you know, our, our, our applications will be more performant. Um, but in the result of doing that, there's some, some things that we have to accept. One thing is that networks inherently are, um, uh, or can be generally unreliable, right? In a um, uh, distributed environment, the notion of a node being down, in other words, it, it, it has crashed, or is it just network latency uh, is the same thing because you don't know, right? You don't know 
uh, because you're loosely coupled and you're using uh, the notion of message passing, you don't know whether or not the, um, uh, the client that you're speaking to, so to speak, is actually up or not. So in order to do that, you have to have um, uh, philosophies and, and patterns in place and how to handle the scenarios. So um, that brings us to essentially the, the idea of ACA and what does ACA do uh, that provides us um, the various uh, patterns and the various tools to be able to reason about and to manage uh, this new environment that we want to leverage. So what is ACA? Um, if you take a look at ACA in general, um, a, a lot of times po folks look at it as a framework. We like to really call it more like a toolkit. Um, in the sense that it provides you uh, a, a host of different libraries and a host of different tools that allow you to achieve objectives that are designed uh, in a distributed fashion uh, by default. And I'll explain what I mean like that in a second. Um, so we call it a toolkit and a runtime uh, for building highly concurrent applications uh, that are distributed and are resilient and it, it basically relies uh, on a message-driven construct um, uh, to, to build applications on the, the JVM. And in that toolkit, uh, we provide a lot of different uh, pieces to the puzzle, right? So um, one of the primary ones is the notion of the actor system. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that uh, in a little bit here. But we have the notion of an actor system. We have the notion of the ability to support remoting, which means you're going to go across machines. Uh, it's not the actual same physical machine. We have the notion of routing, which helps with um, uh, basically what a, a regular hardware router does uh, through software. Um, the notion of clustering, where you can cluster multiple machines together. and um, uh, a really exciting feature is the notion of cluster sharding where you can take a look at a, a group of physical machines um, that are actually, you know, actual separate machines. However, you can look at them kind of like a virtual mach single machine. And uh, as we talk, I'll talk about that in a little bit here and explain uh, how that is a, a really nice feature. The notion of ACA persistence um, has some very powerful uh, philosophies behind it and so forth. And um, uh, ACA Streams, I'm sure you've heard of, is uh, an exciting new um, uh, part that will be included into the next series of ACA, and a whole lot more uh, features in ACA that are really, really powerful. So the actor system in and of itself um, is a different way to reason about uh, problem solving, right? So in a monolithic system, where you would have um, uh, essentially a system that's going to be tightly coupled where the, um, the components of the system, if you will, uh, have a direct connection to the interfaces or the objects within that system. So in other words, they have a, a direct reference to them, uh, what, what I would call a, a hardcore reference. Um, in a ACA or in an actor-based system, it doesn't work that way. Essentially, the actors uh, do not have a direct reference to each other. They have a, a, something called an actor ref, which allows them to reference each other, but they don't have um, a, a hard, tangible reference to one another. And then the way that they communicate with one another is by pass, passing messages back and forth. And what ACA provides you with is the construct to be able to do that um, those messages are serialized, so you can send them across the, the network. Uh, it in, it uh, incorporates the notion of dispatching, so it, it gives you the ability to, to control um, how many threads are allocated and, and such, and, and the, the executor types that you would like to use. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, routing, and it employs this idea of location transparency, which is really important because that allows you to use um, the same 
um, model or the same programming design to design a system that would run locally as you would run one that is uh, distributed. And that's pretty significant if you step back and think about it for a second. Because now the code that you're writing um, will work both on a local environment as well as a distributed environment. And how does it do that? It does it through configuration. Um, so when we come into this idea of ro uh, remoting, the model or the philosophy that ACA presents is distributed by default. That's the mentality behind it. So it provides this unifying um, programming model. It employs the notion of referential or location transparency, as I just mentioned. So when you have two actors and one is on the same storm, uh, the same machine, and one is on another machine, um, the way that they know about each other is through configuration. If you take a look at the code, the code is going to be exactly the same. It's just one is located on, a, on one, one physical machine and another is located on a different one. So that API is the same API whether you're talking locally or remote. Um, and then that is distinguished by configuration and it provides you a real succinct way to build these types of message-driven applications. Um, so if you take a look at the concept of routing here, um, I think one of the best ways to take a peek at this is to just look at it through, through a, uh, a picture, right? A picture's worth a thousand words. So when you're thinking about a concurrent environment, you're basically setting up a way to um, allow two routes to the same endpoint, okay? And then you're relying on um, threading or something of this nature to swap back and forth uh, to give you uh, performance. And that works great. However, when you start to run into um, uh, the challenges of like bottlenecks and such, um, you need to think of, of how to solve the problem in a different way. So you want to think of it more like a parallel environment. So rather than having um, two queues that are going to route to the same uh, endpoint, you're now going to have two endpoints, basically. And that's what routing is all about. And when you take a look at that in ACA, um, that's, again, done by configuration. Uh, the, the code that you write for the actor is exactly the same as it would be as if it was a router. Um, when you start the actor up, there's, there's a slight difference. But other than that, the code is identical. And then you can identify your router structure within a configuration file. So there's several different types of routing strategies you can use. Um, so let's say, for example, we have this toll booth here. And our first pass is we create a single actor, we spin it up, and then we have multiple um, under the covers. ACA provides uh, concurrency management. Uh, and so it's, it's going to be proficient to a certain level. But as the load increases, we may decide, hey, rather than employing this toll booth as a single actor, we're going to set them up as a router. And what that means is then multiple actors will be spun up that essentially do the exact same thing, but it's all managed by configuration. And the, and the pull, it, there's a different strategies you can use. You can create a pool of router, and that pool can be dynamically scaled and all kinds of things. So all that is done and given to you as part of the ACA toolkit framework. And uh, it's driven by configuration. So you don't have to write special code to support that. I spoke about clustering. Clustering is a very powerful concept in ACA uh, where you can take a loosely group of systems, meaning separate machines, and then you can present them as a single system. And you get this idea of peer-to-peer -peer communications throughout the cluster, and it's a decentralized model. And so therefore, it becomes very resilient. You don't have any um, single point of failure. You don't have a single uh, bottleneck. And um, you also have uh, automatic uh, failure detection. And you can implement the routing that we saw in the previous slide uh, in a clustered environment as clustered routers. And so this becomes a very powerful paradigm that is driven by the toolkit. And um, the, the developer and the architect, they don't have to write special code uh, behind the scenes for, for this type of support. So 
you're getting this whole idea of a distributed toolkit under the covers um, without having to pay the price of writing special code or worrying about concurrency and locking and all these things to leverage it. Um, the next um, piece I think that is very exciting is the idea of cluster sharding. If you're familiar with database sharding, um, cluster sharding is, is, is very similar in philosophy. Again, it's this idea of being distributed by default mentality. I can spin up um, a cluster sharded system on a single machine. That may not make sense, um, but it makes sense when you're writing things like uh, integration tests and you spin up multi uh, um, multiple, multiple JVMs and you spin up nodes in each JVM and then you can kind of test your uh, system uh, prior to deploying it, say. Uh, the access to your system now you get a, a more of a, like a logical uh, entry point into the cluster. So whereas in a regular remoting environment, you would have to know the location of a particular actor. In this scenario, you do not, right? You just have to know essentially the shard of which that actor is on, and then you can send a message to the shard, and then under the covers, ACA will resolve where the actual actor lies and, and make sure that the actor gets the message. It will also do things like activation and passivation. So if you have a system where you have um, a, a good way to think about this is domain-driven design, right? If you're familiar with that, domain-driven design has the notion of, of, of something called an entity, and an entity has ID associated to it. Um, so you want to make sure that your, your message goes to a particular actor, but not just a particular actor of a given type, uh, to a particular instance of an actor, because inside that actor you're managing something um, in regards to state. And so it always has to go to the same instance. So the cluster sharding uh, solution will ensure that that happens. At the end, if the actor is not used for some set amount of time, to save resources, it'll spin the actor down. And the next time a message comes into that particular actor, the system will spin the actor back up and re-instantiate its previous state, and then you know, you'll just keep on running. So this is, a, under the covers, a complex solution, but it's a very powerful um, API which allows uh, architects and developers to build these types of systems. This is a, a scenario where you would use this as where uh, your system basically um, expands the capabilities of a system, uh, single machine. Act of persistence is uh, persistence in general. The management of state is something we're all very used to, right, especially in a monolithic application. You create, read, update, delete um, uh, information, and you, court, you store that current state in the database. Act of persistence um, can be used for that exact same thing. The metaphor is a little bit different. Um, if you think of, uh, or if you're familiar with event sourcing or things along those lines, ACA persistence out of the box provides you that, that metaphor. Um, additionally, ACA persistence provides you the ability to maintain state in an actor. And in the event of a system problem, um, ACA persistence uh, I'm not a system problem, but in the, if the actor crashes, ACA can self-heal and spin that actor back up and bring it back up to the previous state it was at prior to crashing. Another thing that you can do um, in, in, with ACA persistence and coupled with um, cluster sharding is, is if you identify a hot spot in your cluster, you can move your actor to another node. And when you spin the actor back up, it's going to be in the same state that it was when you took it down. So a lot of very powerful uh, distributed concepts are given to you out of the box with ACA. And um, uh, it gives you an easy way to, or an easier way to build these types of systems. Um, one of the more recent things that is being added to ACA is the notion of uh, ACA streams. And, um, ACA Streams is, is a really cool uh, new feature that will be added, and it's the idea of uh, managing back pressure. So when you're building these kinds of systems, <clears throat> sometimes you'll run into a scenario where you have back pressure where the 
the destination that's receiving uh, the, the message uh, just cannot handle the load. Uh, there's ways that you can handle that through routing, but they don't always solve the problem. So in a back pressure scenario with something like ACA Streams, the source and the destination work together to manage back pressure. And basically, this allows the destination to tell the source, hey, you're moving too fast for me. You need to slow down. And um, that, that connection between the, the two components allows the system to manage those back pressure issues. This is a different idea than queuing. And I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but I, I encourage you to dig into it because there's some great stuff that's coming out about this. And it also provides you an interesting uh, possibility of, of a traceable path, um, where in a typical message-driven system, that's a little bit more difficult because once the message is sent, um, it's, it's, if you're familiar with network syncing a lot of times, you'll, you'll set up a, um, or you'll compose a sequence of events. And what will happen is one object will process an event and pass it off to the sync, and then they're done. Uh, that they're, they're done with that operation, and they're not even really sure where it went, but the programmer knows where it went because he attached the appropriate components. Um, this allows that loose coupling concept that I was talking about. And that's how messaging works. With streaming, however, it's a little bit different. It gives you an opportunity to embrace some other ideas. So I know we're, this is a whole lot of stuff, but one of the things that um, I think is important to understand is um, the, the power of ACA and what it brings you. Um, our um, chief architect um, uh, uh, quoted uh, a, a quote that I thought was really good, and he said, you know, I, I look at ACA, Victor Klang, I look at ACA as the native of distributed computing um, because a lot of people jump in and say, you know, hey, it provides you concurrency, and it does, right? That's just a feature of it. But what it really provides you is the ability to build a distributed application. And I think that's, that's where it really, really shines. So I thought that that quote was really, really uh, a great quote. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump into um, some examples, some simple examples of Java um, and how you would use Java and ACA together. Um, I'm not going to go into any advanced clustering and all that, um, but uh, I want to show you that even with Java, um, you know, especially when you consider Java 8, uh, you can build very powerful ACA applications just like you can in Scala uh, because a lot of folks think that in order to use ACA, you have to use Scala, and that's not the case. So in this scenario, what I've set up is essentially um, a student and a teacher. And the student is going to uh, ask the teacher questions or a question and the, the uh, uh, teacher is going to respond. So the first thing that when you, when you consider this in, in an ACT environment is you want to think about a message. What is a message? So in distribution or in distributed environments, the first and, and, and one of the most important things is the notion of immutability. You want uh, your system as a whole is immutable. And as a result, what that means then is the messages you're passing back and forth uh, need to be immutable. That's, that's one of the requirements. Under the Covers Act, it does not enforce that, but that's basically the, the protocol. Uh, as you dig through the ACA documentation, um, it's made very clear all your messages should be immutable. When you do this in Scala, it's, it's relatively simple. You can use something called a case class. And the... Um, the um, uh, Scala compiler will compile that into bytecode that is immutable. In Java, it's a little bit different, but you can still do it. Um, if you've been programming in Java for a while, this is not a new, uh, new idea. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff out there that you can use uh, to do this. Um, in my examples, I wanted to try to keep it as Java-specific as possible. And, um, but I will uh, throw out some other libraries that you can use that can assist you in this. So we have this, we'll start out with a message first. This is the question message. And we want to make sure that we uh, make it serializable because we may be sending it to a remote actor. Our teacher uh, may be remote. Um, and 
we're going to make everything final. Now, in this example, I'm using attributes as opposed to setters and getters. Some folks don't like that. Um, I think it's, it's an easy way to reason about your message, but you could do this as a private final string for the message and then set up a getter. The one thing that you would not do, however, is uh, use a setter because then you would break your mutability uh, or, or you would make your, your message mutable. So you set up a constructor that's going to take in string message. And what I like to do is um, uh, set up a constructor and then inside that constructor um, have the notion of a validation. So one of the ways that you can do that is by using um, the Guava preconditions library provided by Google. It's a very powerful um, uh, library that will ass essentially assert whether, <coughs> excuse me, the constructor argument is uh, valid. So I want to make sure my string isn't empty, right, uh, or something like this. Um, and then I'm basically going to set my uh, private very or my public attribute there to the message that's passed into the constructor, and um, uh, um, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. And now, when you refer to this object, you can then just uh, refer to the attribute in and of itself. The one thing I have to note here, however is that um, you do have to implement two strings equal in hash code. Because inside your actor, uh, you may be doing a comparison of the message that you're receiving. And if you do not implement those me methods, then depending on the complexity of your message, uh, the uh, equals uh, may say they're not equal. Um, now, there are uh, libraries out there that can help you do this. You don't have to write these yourself. You could use um, the Apaches uh, or the Apache library to do that for you. Uh, Google has something called auto value, which is pretty interesting. Um, uh, it's it's uh, a little weird when you first look at it, uh, but it definitely does what you want it to do. It creates a, a completely immutable class. Um, and so it, it will do the two strings equal and hash code for you. And it does it through annotations. And when you compile the class, it will generate um, a uh, immutable class for you. In this scenario, uh, I just put a note there, you will have to write the, the two string equals in hash code. Um, the next um, message will be the answer message, and it's, it's very much the same thing. You might say, hey, why couldn't you just write an abstract class and then have these guys extend it? You could do that. Um, but in reality, a lot of times, the message may contain extra uh, uh, variables, right? It may contain extra parameters, who knows what, maybe um, the time or something like this. So I wanted to identify these as um, um, uh, separate messages uh, so you could kind of get the idea. And I, I see several questions coming in while I'm talking here. Uh, just because of the time, um, I will go ahead and, and, and do my best to answer these questions at the end of the presentation. So this is the, essentially the answer message that um, will be responded back to the student. Um, all right, so now we jump into the actor. Oops, went ahead too far there. The student actor. So here we have a student actor, and this is, again, in Java, obviously. There's several imports that you have to do, uh, actor, ref, props, and so forth. And we set up this class called student actor. It's going to uh, extend untyped actor, which is what you need to do in Java. <laughs> You'll see at the top there we have this thing called props. And props is the type safe a library for managing properties. And this is the recommended best practice for when you're creating actors. You basically set up a um, uh, a internal properties factory within the actor that is going to um, essentially uh, do whatever it needs to do. And in this particular instance, it's going to create and return a new student. And you'll see there that the student has a reference to the actor or the teacher. So one of the things that has to be passed into 
this particular property's construction is a reference to the actor, and we'll see how we do that shortly. And what properties ends up returning is essentially a reference to the <coughs> excuse me, teacher actor. That's one of the distinctions of actors within ACA is that you don't actually have access to the actor in and of itself. You get access to a reference to the actor. Um, we set up logging, and then the first thing that the, the student's going to do in this scenario is uh, within the construction of the student, because it's going to have a valid act, uh, reference to the actor, the student is going to send a question to the uh, teacher. And the question that it's going to uh, send is, um, teacher, I have a new question for you, and my question is, what is the square root of pi? You'll notice there after the, um, the actual message is sent, uh, it sends this thing called self. And what that's doing is it's basically sending a reference to the teacher actor. So when the teacher actor responds, the teacher actor will know who to respond to. And that self is, is um, uh, essentially the reference back to the student. The tell that you see there <coughs> is a method that is essentially a fire and forget method. It's asynchronous. So all the communications are asynchronous within an actor. So the teacher is going to tell, or actually the student is going to tell the teacher, here's my question, um, what is the square root of pi? And then the student within this thing called the on receive loop is going to sit and basically wait, not blocking. When I say wait, they're just idle at this point. Uh, they're waiting for this message to come back. And the message will then be, just for the purposes of our example, it is going to be long. When we go to the teacher actor, <coughs> excuse me, the teacher actor is created. And um, it's a little bit simpler because the teacher actor actually doesn't have a reference to the student. It gets it to that mechanism that we saw earlier called self. So the teacher is going to receive a message in, this, in the on receive method. It's going to log it. You don't have to log it there. It's just a, a, it can be a practice, especially while you're learning. You can then go look at, the, at the, your log and make sure that the message was received. And then it's basically going to say, sender.tell get answer message. And what that method there, get answer, is just an internal private method within the actor. And the purpose of it is it, it, you would put your logic in there, right? So for example, you would parse the message and you would say, okay, what is the message asking? Oh, it's asking this. Okay, what is the answer to that? Great, here's the answer. I'm going to create a new answer message I'm going to inject my answer into it, and that's what I'm going to return. So I just kind of composed that all into a single line. I could have made it a separate line and said something like, um, uh, you know, uh, answer, you know, type answer, capital answer, smaller case answer, equals get answer. And then I could have, within that receive loop, maybe uh, did some diagnosis if I wanted to, and then pass that back either way. But to, to keep the, the uh, example simple, um, I kind of took this approach with it. So now that we see this, we see the messages that we created. We see the two actors that we've created and how they're going to communicate back and forth. All that communication is asynchronous. And um, at the end of the day, the last thing that we have to do is we have to leverage what the runtime does, right, the microkernel in ACA. So in our typical applications, we might use JBoss or Tomcat, and we may front end it with uh, uh, Apache Web Server or something like this. ACA has, has something called the ACA runtime. Um, and essentially what we would do is we would create a class. We would give it a name. We would import the appropriate ACA library components. And then we would set up this um, <clears throat> um, class, which would be uh, school, and it would be given the actor system from ACA. We set up our logger. And then the next two lines we see there, we see a reference to two methods, create teacher and create student. Um, and what happens here is they call those two messages. 
the actor system has something called actor of, and you're passing into it the properties that we saw in the previous actors, and you're naming it teacher, and you're doing the same thing for student. You'll notice student occurs after teacher, and the reason is, is because we want to pass in teacher to student, uh, because student has to know which teacher they're sending the message to. And um, that's essentially uh, the, the, the entire set of code. Uh, I've seen some people have asked, uh, can they get access to it? What I'll do is I will uh, present this example and post it to a GitHub link that, that folks can then go ahead and, and download. Uh, but there's also a lot of other great um, things with uh, our activator. And you can then go ahead and um, pull those down through the use of activator. And there's uh, many more robust examples in there as well. Um, <clears throat> I did see an interesting question. Can I use ACA within a container like Tomcat? Um, yes, you can do that. But um, the question I always ask is why? Um, generally, when building systems of this nature, um, uh, if you're going to use Tomcat, I, you know, that's used generally for something else that you're going to run in. A lot of times you may get, um, perhaps you want to use um, a, a different front end or whatever. ACA can run completely on its own. It does not need a container. It does not need Tomcat, JBoss, anything of this nature. Um, but if, if for some reason you wanted to spin it up in an environment like that, you could. So at this point, uh, this is pretty much uh, the conclusion. I know this is a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, and so um, I want to throw out for uh, the few minutes that we have left for any questions, and I've, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, questions being thrown out. One of them is OSGI. Yeah, you can use it in conjunction with OSGI. Um, we, there is a library um, uh, for OSGI. Um, you know, you can go out and uh, I would encourage you to explore that on your own and so forth. Um, I like this question, can ACA help me to develop game servers? Uh, yes. Uh, the advanced ACA for Scala course, the use case is a game. And inside that use case, um, we leverage uh, ACA data replication, which you can kind of think of it as a distributed cache, uh, which is really, really neat. It's still experimental, uh, but it does some really, really cool stuff. Um, so yes, you can use it for game servers. Um, is the tell message sending guaranteed? <laughs> is message, is, is message uh, uh, delivery guaranteed? Um, so no, it is not, right? It, it, it is a uh, fire and forget, right? In a distributed system, guarantee is an extremely difficult thing to do, right? And the cost of guarantee can be extremely expensive. So uh, one of the ways to handle that type of scenario is you know, your age-old ACNAC, right? Um, you're expecting a response. Uh, one way you can implement that, and I, I didn't show it in this example, is through using ask. Um, if you're familiar with futures, what an ask will do is it's kind of like response request. So instead of sending tell, you would send ask. And what ask does is spin up a future. Um, and you're waiting for that future to, to complete and you set a timeout. And so if the um, future completes with a success, that means you've got a response back. And if it times out, then, then you've got a failure. There's other ways that you can um, implement um, uh, guaranteed delivery to a certain extent, although I wouldn't say it's guaranteed. And the ACA documentation covers that, I think, um, uh, quite succinctly in both Java and Scala. So um, let's see, what other questions do we have here? Is it possible to develop ESB product using ACA? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, it, it, there's distributed ESBs out there, as there, you know, in today's world, and, and ACA is, is going to give you the ability to build a distributed system. But what I would say to that is, you need to think about what the purpose of an enterprise service bus is used for. Um, and when you think about that in relationship to um, 
a message basing or distributed system, um, what I would encourage you to do and what I try to encourage everybody to do is take a step back and um, try to set aside for a little while uh, the way you reason about things. Try to understand what distributed computing is and how it operates and then go back and take a look at your use case, take a look at your problem. And then you may be able to view it under a different light and realize that, wow, some of the assumptions that I made are no longer um, required in this new environment or this new toolkit, uh, so to speak. Um, so yes, you could, but uh, is that something that you'd want to do? Uh, I don't know. Again, it's really hard to answer this question because you have to take a look at the, the specifics of the use case. You know, you need to know two things. What is the use case and what is the SLA, right? And then you can go ahead and you can begin to answer the question and take a look at what are the right set of tools to solve that problem. Um, uh, does ACA support active-active? I'm not sure what you mean by that question. Um, if you could possibly rephrase that for me, that would be great. How are ACA systems bundled? Um, they're jars, right? So, um, you know, you're basically going to, you, you have an ACA runtime that's going to spin up, and then uh, within that system, um, you may have several jars, right? It all depends on how you, how you configure your system and, and, and how you want to deploy it. It lends naturally uh, to a distributed design in the form of microservices, if, if you want to think about it that way. Um, Without going into great detail, you, because your system is distributed, you can now build a system that is based on um, maybe eight or ten different systems that are loosely coupled and message back and forth running on their own JVMs. This has a significant impact to your deployment strategy because now you can bring down um, a specific part of your system, but it doesn't bring down the entire system. And because under the covers you're using ACA and you're using um, a resilience strategy that's self-healing, your uh, customer's response will still be the same. So let's say, for example, one of your systems is a database and it's talking to an, a legacy database that's a synchronous connection, and right now that's having a problem. The, the, the aspect of or another part of your system that's speaking to that system is still up and running, and it's able to process the fact that the the database side of things is down, and it can respond back in a timely manner. Um, I cannot process your request right now because uh, part of the system is experiencing a problem. Um, the, the, in other words, the, the screen for the customer doesn't just hang, and they have no idea what's going on. So um, there's a lot of, uh, I think, very fascinating ways to reason there. Um, is it possible to send data stream to an actor through some kind of message? Streaming, um, when you say data stream, um, when, I, when I think of a stream in a non ACA stream point of view, um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you can set up a message, say, for example, you're streaming images from a database rather than uh, pulling out a blob. And so, you could do some type of future composition within an actor, or you could spin up a child actor or use some type of routing strategy uh, that would um, asynchronously ask for that streamed binary image from the database. Um, and then when that completes, it would respond back to the requester with a message. So that, that's one example uh, where you could use it. Um, can ACA be used significantly on mobile devices? There's been some exploration in there, but um, I don't want to misquote that. That's something I'm, I'll have to confirm. I don't believe we have it running on mobile devices yet, but uh, that's definitely something that I'll have to double check. Can actors scale better than threads, and how is this done? Yes. Actors don't, it's not a thread to actor model, right? It's, it's a lightweight kind of like pseudo thread. So you can have 
many actors on a single threat. Um, ACA under the covers, depending on how you configure it and how the dispatcher is configured, it may spin up actors on different threads, uh, and it's very good at managing that. There's a lot of use cases out there or uh, white papers out there where, you know, you have tens of thousands of actors spinning up on a very small thread pool and processing messages at a very high rate. Uh, within ACA clustering, do they have any load balancing capabilities? Yes, absolutely. Now, we have to define what we mean by load balancing, though. Um, uh, in a clustered environment, um, ACA will, as you add new nodes to the cluster, it will rebalance uh, across those new nodes that have been added. What it doesn't do is, it, is obviously, it can't spin up a new machine. Um, you could code that to happen if you have some scripts or something, and then you send an actor a message that says, hey, um, uh, this new node has spun up. It then, it, or, or as the machine spins up, the configuration of that machine will join a, the cluster that already exists, and then the ACA cluster will redistribute, uh, including those new nodes. So I think we're running past our time limit here, so I wanted to jump back to you, Laura. Yep, thanks, Duncan. Um, there's been a, 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 a ton of questions that we've been getting from Duncan, and what I'm thinking right now um, in the interest of time is, Duncan, that we can pull together a blog post with um, that compiles some of these questions and publish that on typesafe.com so that uh, not only the participants who've joined us today but also um, folks that weren't able to make it to the live presentation can um, not only watch the slides, but then also um, read through the uh, Q&A section. Um, and then Duncan will, can also follow up with folks directly if your question wasn't answered via email. Um, yep. If that works for you, Duncan, I think that might be the, the, the best um, decision moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Feel free to email me, and, and uh, I will answer your question. And also, I will post the code on um, the GitHub. Um, I do maintain the ACA persistence um, driver for Mongo, and I have some uh, example applications out there that you can take a peek at. While they're, they're ACA persistence specific, they still use actors. They still use messaging and stuff like this. So um, you can find some interesting stuff there as well. And again, I highly recommend Activator. Um, uh, we are in the process of putting together a fast track to act with Java course, and that hopefully that will be ready soon. And uh, our book, um, uh, Active or Active Reactive uh, Application Development, uh, will have both Scala and Java versions of the source code. And in in the book itself, it will have that as well. So um, that, you'll definitely see be... more more of this kind of stuff. Great. A few people were asking when you expect your book to be done. Do you have any time update on timeline for that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, ask Jamie. No, I'm just teasing. All right. Um, so we, yes, we're going to release. There's another chapter being released. Uh, chapter four is actually being released before chapter three. That should be out within, I think, the next week or so. They're doing the final touches. It's actually gone to MEEP already. Uh, chapter three is. Um, uh, really some uh, hard, not hardcore, but it's kind of like an introduction to basic ACA with Java and Scala, and then chapter five, or, yeah, chapter five will be advanced, and then chapter six jumps into CQRS. Chapter three is 65% done, so I expect it to be done within the next couple of weeks and pushed out uh, hopefully by the end of February. The, the entire book is probably still six months, eight months away to be complete, I would imagine. And then, of course, Jamie and Roland's book is, is absolutely fantastic, uh, you know, reactive design patterns. So I would I highly re recommend that. There's three or four books out there now, uh, Reactive Development with Play. Um, there's one uh, specifically uh, oriented towards domain-driven design. Um, and uh, so there's some really good stuff coming out now. That sounds great. We'll also compile a list of some resources if you're looking to get started with ACA um, in the blog post uh, so that if you are just picking it up or if you're looking to introduce it to your team, um, we, we have some good getting started resources for um, you to take a look at. 
Um, yep. All right, Duncan. Well, thank you so much for presenting today. This is great, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, hope to uh, share all of this information with you soon, and hope to see you on future webinars. Um, have a good hey, 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 Laura. Time. One. Yeah. I'm sorry, Dana. One other thing. Um, folks were asking for the email address, so it looks like somebody sent it out. Okay, great. Yes. Yep. I sent that out, so people can, people can bother Duncan directly now. Um, just Duncan Devore at TypeSafe.com. Um, and my, my right. uh, GitHub ID is on the slide there, at IronFish. Perfect. Okay. All right, everyone. I hope you have a good rest of your day or evening, whatever time zone you're in, and we will be in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Have a good afternoon.